Number one, Katya approximates pi correct to four decimal places by using the following expression, that whole thing that is here, ¿cierto? So we need to calculate Katya's approximation of pi correct to four decimal places. And essentially, we just need to figure out what number this whole thing gives us. So the easiest way, I think, is using your calculator. So we pop out our calculator, we put three plus that whole thing. Now, how do we put that whole thing into our calculator? There's a couple ways. I think the easiest is the following. You press alpha, this green button here. You press y equals. It brings up this mini uh, menu, ¿cierto? And in this mini menu, you press the first one, ¿cierto? The first one. And you get that fraction, ¿sí? And so using this, it's suddenly very, very easy to plug in. So I put one on top, six on the bottom. I use this function thingy majingi again because we have another fraction, and boom, we have it just like the problem. We press enter, we get this, ¿cierto? The only drawback is that you almost always get the answer in fraction, but that's no problem because we can just, you know, plug it in again, and we get this, ¿cierto? So our answer was 3.14, give me one second, 6, 7, 8, and another 8, ¿sí? So if we're making it correct to four decimal places, well, let's count four decimal places. Here we have our first one, our sec, whoops. Okay, apparently that's not how it works. We have our first one there, our second one there, our third one, and our fourth one, ¿cierto? So now, because it's correct to four decimal places, we take the fourth one, which is this seven here, and we compare it to the one next to it, ¿cierto? And so comparing it to the one next to it, do we, do we like round it up or round it down? If it's from 5 or above, ¿cierto? which would be 5 to 9, we go up. ¿cierto? If it's 1 through 4, we go down. This 8 is from 5 through 9, so we round it up. Our answer for part A is going to be 3.1468. Part B, calculate the percentage error in using cat yes for decimal place approximation of pi compared to the exact value of pi in your calculator. So what the heck is percentage error? Well, it is how far off my estimation is. So what I can do is pull up my formula booklet, which is right around here. We look for, what was it called again? Exp um, t -t 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 percentage error, and it's there. ¿cierto? So we have VA minus VE divided by VE. I'm going to pull this on the side, but you know that it's in your formula booklet. Um, we have E being equal to absolute value of VA minus VE divided by VE. All of this times 100%. See? So relatively easy. Just make sure that you are organized in your steps. The VA we said was approximate. See? The VE is like the actual one or the exact. So exact is going to be pi on calculator. Approx is going to be 3.1468, which is from part A. See? All right. Um, so if I plug this into my calculator, some of you are probably thinking, how in the heavens do you plug in a absolute value? ¿Cierto? Now, I'm pretty sure there's a way, but I'd rather just be practical. An absolute value is all, all it does is turn your number, it turns your number positive. See? So if you have absolute value of, let's say, negative 4, this is just going to be 4. If you have the absolute value of negative uh, 70, ¿cierto? Uh, your actual number is going to be 70. See? If you have the absolute value of an already positive number, let's say 23, what happens here? Nothing, really. It just stays positive. ¿cierto? So all it does is turn your number positive. Um, so if we get a negative value, we will just turn it positive. See? That is the game plan. I will plug into the calculator now. It should look something like this. So we use the fraction thingy again because it's what I love. Uh, VA is approximate. We said it's this guy here, ¿cierto? 3.1468 minus the exact, which is pi. So we use our calculator to plug in pi. It's right below the clear button. In my case, we have all of this times 100%. See, so it's just times 100. We see what we get. First of all, it's a positive value. So I can just leave it like that, ¿cierto? Second of all, oh, that's the answer. See, so we get 0 0.16575. 4, see? So that is for part B. 
and that is part A, that is number one. Is that it? Uh, my advice here would really be like, be conscious of how the rounding up works when they ask for correct to four decimal places and stuff like that. Same with significant figures. And anytime there's a word that you don't understand, realize that it's a keyword, see? Percentage error, don't freak out. Is it in your formal booklet? There's more in there than what you think. Number two, Deb. Deb used the thermometer to record the maximum daily temperature over 10 consecutive days. Her results in degrees Celsius C are shown below. See, for this data set, find the value of the mode, the mean, the standard deviation. Now, there are ways to find the mean by hand and you can find the standard deviation by hand, but it's a little more annoying. See, the one thing you can find by hand is the mode and it's relatively easy. See, so what you want to do is kind of like for the mode, cierto? it sounds a little bit like most. See, that's the word that should come to mind. So for mode, it's whatever number shows up the most. <laughs> Literally, see, for example, number nine. Do we see any other number nine? No. So for nine, there is only one. See? For what's our next highest? Let's go with 10. Cierto? So here's one 10. Do I have another 10? Nope. So for 10, there's one. For 11, there's one 11. Okay, there's only one 11. Boring. 12, there's no 12. 13, I've got how many boys? I got one. 14, I got just about three. 15, I got just about two. 16, I got just about one. All right, clearly my mode is 14. Part A, bada bim, bada boom. Uh, mode is 14. 14. You can get specific. You can kind of like draw this, cierto? And that should give you full credit. But part A, mode is 14. So for mean and standard deviation, as I said earlier, you can get it by hand, but like, why would you make yourself suffer? See, pull out your calculator, go to stat edit. Why stat? Because this is like a stati statistics problem. Mean and standard deviation sounds like st statistics. That's why you go to stat and edit, cierto? Why do we edit? It brings up a, a list and we can put our values here. So give me a moment. I'm gonna put my values. 14, 15, 14, 11, yada, yada, yada. Wonderful. What do I do now? Now, wait, give me one second. Let me double check. It's always worth double checking. 11, 10, 9, 14, 15, 16, 13. Yeah, cool. So now we go back to stat and now we're calculating stuff. Cierto? One var stats. Why one var? One var makes reference to one variable. Cierto? And so since these are all um, maximum daily temperatures and not two th separate things, I just use one var stats. Cierto? So my list is, of course, all one. There is no frequen frequency list in this case, so I can leave it empty and I just press calculate. Cierto? It spits out all of this information. The hardest part here is remembering what the heck each symbol is. Okay? So. The mean is going to be this symbol. Standard deviation is going to be, let me remember this guy here, if I'm not mistaken. Let me quadruple check that. Yes, it is that. Standard deviation is this symbol. Mean is that symbol. So according to this, my mean is 13.1. My standard deviation is 2.211. Let's put a couple extra numbers just so that we get full credit. 3344, blah, blah, blah. See? All right. That is for parts B and C. If you're worried about getting like full credit, you, for parts B and C, you need to literally say like, took values to L1 and then um, stat calc one more stats. And so what you're doing here is that you're describing to whoever's grading, like what steps you took on the calculator, see? And that, trust me, is good enough. See, that's what I did on my B exam. I got full credit, all good. So that's why you put it for part B, part C. And of course, well, you put the answers, cierto? All right, so that is number two. Number three, let's keep going. A piece of candy is made in the shape of a solid hemisphere. The radius of the hemisphere is six millimeters, cierto? So the radius, they already colored it in, it's right there, beautiful. And they also tell us that it's a hemisphere, keyword. Part A, calculate the total surface area 
of one piece of, ha of candy. Now, why the heck is total in bold? When total is in bold, or when any word is in bold, of course it's important. And here it's like hinting you at something that you can fall into as a trap. Right? So when we think about surface area, it's like what covers my object if I dip it in chocolate. I shit you not, that is probably the best way to remember. You take your object, this guy, you dip it in chocolate, what gets covered? What gets covered is, you know, the well, the hemisphere, cierto? so all of this outside here. And also, it's a little bit harder to draw, but in the back there as well. Cierto? So all around the hemisphere, it gets covered in chocolate. And there's one more thing that gets covered, which is why they put the word total, so that people like, you know, hopefully don't mess it up. And it's the bottom part. Cierto? Most people calculate only the part of the hemisphere, but hey, don't forget the circle. The circle is also there. See? So the total surface area for part A is going to be uh, area circle plus area hemisphere. See? And so pulling out the formula booklet, right? Uh, whatever, I'll just show you guys why not. Here we have uh, area of sphere, for example. Surface area of sphere, it's that there. So surface area sphere, surface area sphere, we saw is um, 4 pi r squared. Cierto? Surface area of a circle is surface area of a circle. Oh, area of a circle, that's how they put it, is right here. Cierto? So area of a circle is a equals Ba -ba -bum. pi r squared. So down here, we're going to have pi r squared plus area of hemisphere, which we said was 4 pi r squared. Ladies and gentlemen, I just committed a mistake on purpose. What is my mistake? Take a moment. What is my mistake? You see here, the surface area of a sphere is 4 pi r squared. Now, a, a sphere looks a little bit like this. Right now, we're looking at a hemisphere, which, as you can tell, is half of a sphere. That's also why hemi, half hemi. I don't know if hemi goes for half, but whatever, man. It's half a sphere, okay? So this guy here, area of a hemisphere, or for the surface area of a hemisphere, see, is going to be this guy divided by 2, because it's half, cierto? So I actually have to go like that. Ooh, careful. So this is the total area that I'm going for, for part A, cierto? Now, what is R? They gave us R earlier. R is 6 millimeters, cierto? So pi uh, 6 squared plus 2 pi 6 squared, see? So this is 36 pi plus 72 pi, see? If you don't believe me, you can check your calculator. This is 108 pi, vale? So that is for part A. You can leave it in terms of pi. I never liked to leave it in terms of pi because I am picky and we all have our, you know, our things. So 1 and 8 times pi gives me that. That is so for part A, it's 3, 3, uh, whoops, 3, 3, 9, 0.29, 0.292. See? Make sure you put the units millimeters squared. Squared because it is an area. If it would be volume, it would be cubed. If it's distance, it's to the power of one. So that is part A, not it? Cool, part B. Um, they tell us the total surface area of the candy is coated in chocolate. <laughs> Look at that, coated in chocolate. It is known that one gram of chocolate covers an area of 240 millimeters squared. Calculate the weight, Ojo, the weight of chocolate required to coat one piece of candy. So the piece of candy has how much surface area? It has this amount of surface area. ¿cierto? Um, and so if we take this amount of surface area and we divide it by how much one gram of chocolate covers, which is this here, we will end up with the amount of grams of chocolate needed to cover the whole thing. ¿cierto? So we take the 339.292, we divide it by 240, and this will give us the amount of grams of chocolate that covers for this, cierto? So, we take this bad boy, 
this divided by this. We got that ba -ba -ba, one point four one three seven one. Cierto? And this, because we're talking about weights, I can just leave it in grams. That is. So this is for part B. Awesome. The biggest part here is fall, uh, being careful with the trap of the hemisphere. And one of the things, and the trap was that you need to make sure you add the circle. And one of the ways you can kind of like avoid that is just be very conscious. If you did dip your object in chocolate, how much gets covered? Usually, if you cut a shape in two, or a figure, because it's in 3D. If you cut a 3D figure in two, the surface area is increased in some way. I mean, of course, it loses some, but there's probably another shape you have to add that you weren't adding before. That's what I'm trying to say. Cool. Number four. The price of gas at Leon's gas station is 1.50 per liter. If a customer buys a minimum of 10 liters, a discount of five is applied. This could be modeled by the following function, blah, 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 which gives the total cost when buying a minimum of 10 liters at Leon's gas station. That's why there's this nasty thing here. X has to be greater than or equal to 10 because that is the 10 liters that the people are buying. Cierto? Cool. X is the number of liters of gas that customer buys, of course. Part A. Find the total cost of buying 40 liters of gas at Leon's gas station. All right, pretty easy. So um, if X is number of liters, then what is total cost? Well, total cost is L, because they tell us that L gives the total cost. All right, this one is pretty straightforward. L of 40 equals 1.50 times 40 minus 5. Anytime they say L of X and you plug in a number for X, that's like that's what it's telling you. See? Cool. So L of 40 is 1.50 times that, which is 1.50 times that, 60 minus 5, 55. See? So total cost of buying 40 liters of gas at Leonsis gas station is 55. Don't forget the units, dollars. That is part A. Part B, find the inverse function and then apply 70 to it. See? Now, in inverse function, this gets taught in a couple of ways. I'm just going to show how it was taught to me. It's the most intuitive for me. So here we go. This L of X is pretty much the same as putting Y. Dale. So trust me on this. Y equals 1.50 X minus 5. If we are talking about the inverse function, what we have to do is take this guy and this guy and flip it. If we flip it, we end up with X equals 1.50 Y minus 5. So what I need to do now is get to something similar to this in the sense that Y is alone. This highlight function really doesn't work on this application. This Y has to get alone, ¿cierto? And so you want to reach Y equals something. And whatever the, what something is, is going to be your inverse function. Okay? So you flip Y and X, end up with something like that, Make sure you get y alone. That is going to be your inverse function. That is the game plan. So that being said, um, I am working from here. Cierto? So getting y alone, I add 5 to the other side. x plus 5 equals 1.50y. I'd rather have y on my left side because it looks nice. So I'm just going to flip it. I haven't done any math stuff yet. Now we divide by 1.50 to both sides. y equals da -da -da, x plus 5 divided by 1.50. This is my inverse function. See? So if you want to be like mega mathy about it, you would pretty much write it like that. Cierto? Now I'm not done yet because the question is asking for plugging 70 to this. Cierto? So I'm going to go ahead, plug in 70 to that. We end up with 70 plus 5 divided by 1.50. Um, da, da, da. This gives me 75 divided by 1.50. See? This is going to be 50. I did this a while ago. Look, just let me just double check. Yeah, baby, that's 50. All right, so that's part B. See? That is part B. All right, now they tell us the price of gas at Erica's gas station, which is a different gas station, is $1.30 uh, per liter. 
A, com a customer must buy a minimum of 10 liters of gas, again, just like the other dude. And the total cost at Erica's gas station is cheaper than Leonidas' gas station when X is greater than K. And to find the minimum value of K. So let's take a moment and think about this for a second. If a customer shows up and buys 10 liters of gas, it will be cheaper at Leonces. It is cheaper at Leonces because this guy has a discount. He's got that minus 5. On the other hand, Erica's gas station does not. ¿cierto? And so where is Erica's gas station more convenient than this other dude? ¿cierto? That is kind of like, kind of like what's going on. ¿sí? And so the way that you set it up is like this. ¿cierto? Erica's gas station charges 1.30 per liter, ¿cierto? but it has no discount. So it's like you can put a plus zero here or whatever. It has no discount. So you cannot have like a y equals 1.30x. What did we have? For Leonces, for Leonces, we had that y was 1.50x minus 5, ¿cierto? Aha! Uh -huh. Now looks like something that we can work with, ¿cierto? I need to kind of like equal them each other or make some sort of inequality to see what goes on, ¿cierto? So the minimum value of k is wherever, I mean, given the concept of the problem, the minimum value of k will be set up like this. We will have 1.30x, which is Erica's, is less than 1.50x minus 5. And so just to leave mega clear why we're putting it like this, remember that this is like a cost function, ¿cierto? And so wherever this 1.50x uh, minus 5 is greater than 1.30x, that means that Leon's gas station is more expensive, ¿cierto? And so we need to find where it's more convenient to go to Erica's, ¿cierto? And that's why we're talking about the minimum value of K. That's why we set it up like that. We need to find X here, ¿sí? So in order to get X alone, we're going to do plus 5 to both sides. I just like starting with that. Then we do minus 1.30X to both sides. We end up with 5 being less than 0.20X. X has to be, ba, ba, bum. this gives us 25, see? Also, here I skipped a step. I hope no one freaked out here. I did a 5 divided by 0 0.20. And I made sure that my X was always like facing the symbol. ¿cierto? My symbol was always facing X. I did the same here. I just, I'd rather have X on the left side. See, that's all I'm doing. That, that, that is a step that I missed. Sorry about that. X has to be greater than 25. And this also sort of implies that the minimum value of K is 25, ¿cierto? Because it is at this cutting, this is like the cutting point, see? Of my decision in respect to this here. All right. Um, that is number four. Number five, we have the Voronoi diagram. Below shows three identical cellular phone towers, T1, T2, T3. A fourth cellular phone tower T4 is located in the shaded region. So somewhere here, there is a T4 going around. The dashed lines in the diagram below represent the edges in the Voronoi diagram. And they tell us a little bit about the scales of my thing. All right, cool. So Tim stands inside the shaded region. Explain why Tim will receive the strongest signal from tower T4. So. Let's explain a little bit Voronoi diagrams. See, so a Voronoi diagram is like, I'm going to make one on the side, actually. See, so let's say that this is the limits of my diagram. And I just put a bunch of dots. See, so in a relatively random way, I put a bunch of dots. And now what the Voronoi diagram does is that it sort of like shades a region around each of these dots. And that does something, ¿cierto? Now what it does... And this is, of course, not drawn like professionally or anything. Let me put another dot here. And so what this does is that all these other dots that are sort of like invisible in a way, but all this white space, ¿cierto? Its closest red dot is whatever region it's in, ¿cierto? And so, for example, if you take 
that guy there, what is its closest red dot? It's this one. You take that guy there, what is its closest red dot? It's this one. And so you keep doing that until you end up with an area. ¿cierto? There's a dot here whose closest is that, and here whose closest is that. And that is sort of like how the Voronoi diagram gets formed. See? That is the intuition of the Voronoi diagram. So if Tim is inside the shaded region, well, oh, and the tower T4 is somewhere in here, well, Tim will receive the strongest signal from the tower T4. Because no matter where he stands in the shaded region, whether it's here or there or there, wherever T4 is, Tim will be closest to T4 no matter what. Because in the shaded region, all of these dots, regardless of, of where they are, are closest to T4 anyway. So that is the answer for part A. That is like literally how you write it. See? Let's see, part A, bada bim bada boom. For part B, they tell us tower T2 has coordinates, negative 9,5. Let me write that real quick. Negative 9,5 is right there. Um, and the edge connecting vertices A and B has equation Y equals 3. So, equation Y equals 3. If you take an, an axis, ¿cierto? or a coordinate plane or whatever, Y equals 3 is here. If I take X equals 2, X equals 2 is here. Okay? That is what they mean by Y equals 3 and X equals 2. ¿Vale? If I say Y equals negative 4, where would that be? y equals negative 4 would be down here. That it? All right, that is intuition of the equals 3. See? So what information does that give me? Well, it gives me the information that this line here, ¿cierto? Is y equals 3. That means that the point A is x comma 3, and the point B is x comma 3, ¿cierto? So it's some x, and it has a 3 inside of it, and that means that this t1 also has a 3 inside of it. Ooh la la. They actually give us the coordinates of t, t1 down the road, and it's pretty evident, like, yep, it's at 3. Okay? So t1, might as well write it down now, is negative 13, comma 3. All right, we need to write down the coordinates of t4. Now, anytime that the IB, like, gives you information, you usually have to use it, ¿cierto? Like, they don't trick you with that kind of stuff. So we have to use the fact that t2 is at negative 9,5, we have to use the fact that here there is a distance of 2, ¿cierto? There is a distance of 2 because t2 is at y equals 5. And so this, this difference here is 2, which is the same 2 that I drew there. Hmm, interesting. Okay. And so t4 has to be like at an equal distance from here to there. So I know that t4 is actually at or we know for a fact that it's got a y value of 1. It's got a y value of 1 because this 3 here, I'm doing minus 2 again. And so t4 has to be somewhere in this height. ¿cierto? All right. We know that t1 is at 13 and t2 is at negative 9. ¿cierto? Now, because these are all like equal distances to each other, the distance from t1 to t2 from the x standpoint is 4 units. ¿cierto? That means that T4 is also 4 units away from T1, so it's negative 13 plus 4, negative 9. Okay? The thing about Voronoi diagrams is that they're, all these points are like, it's very like mirrored or like symmetrical, the distance between one or the other. So in respect to the mirror, that's why I could use this trick here, and also this trick here for the x value. That is, so T4 is actually what I just did there. Negative 9, comma 1. All right, they give us the, uh, that's part B, see? They give us the information that tower T1 has the coordinates, blah, blah, blah. And we need to find the gradient of the edge of the Voronoi diagram between towers T1 and T2. What the hell is gradient? Gradient is the same as slope, which is the same as the symbol M, which is the same as the thing in my trusty, rusty formal booklet, that y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1. See, this is in your formula booklet. It is right there. Look at it. This is a tool that you can use always. So I need to plug in this information. ¿cierto? Now it's, it's asking for the one between t1 and t2. ¿cierto? So what was my points for t1? Well, I figured out that it was, or they tell us, sorry, that it's negative 13,3. And the one of t2 was negative 9,5. So here, 
all you can really like mess up on here is being disorganized. Frankly, I'm just being honest. Kirto? Um, the x1, x2 makes a reference to a set of points. Kirto? So a set of points has like x1 goes with y1, x2 goes with y2. So what goes with y7? x7. Kirto? And no, this is not y to the power of 7. That is a different story. It is y sub 7, which is like the set of points number 7. See? Okay, so just be organized. What is x1? What is y1? Blah, blah, blah. Take a moment. Write down your set of points. Write on top which one each is. Don't get lost. This is your compass. Once you do that, plug in. Cierto? Y2, we said was 5. Minus y1, which is 3. Plug in with parentheses. Plug in with parentheses because that way you avoid um, double negative multiplications and issues like that, cierto? which is about to happen actually. x2 is negative 9 minus x1, which is negative 13. If you always plug in with parentheses, it's going to be very apparent when you have a double negative multiplication. See? So on top we have 5 minus 3. On the bottom we have negative 9 plus 13 because it's double negative. This ends up being 2 divided by... Ba -ba -ba. Four. That took me a little bit harder. <laughs> I really thought about that one for a while. So the gradient is, well, it's one half. See? The thing about the grade, this is the gradient between the point T1 and T2. Cierto? Because it's a Voronoi diagram and they're asking for the edge, for the gradient of the edge of the Voronoi diagram, we need to take a moment and actually do the reciprocal, the negative reciprocal of this guy here. Cierto? And so the reciprocal would be just flipping it, so it's 2, and the negative reciprocal would be multiplying it by negative 1, which is negative 2. See? I don't like part C because it's, it's kind of hard to explain, and I'd rather just tell you, like, memorize that. The edge of a Voronoi diagram, cierto? its gradient is going to be the negative reciprocal of whatever points they're asking for. I know it's awfully specific, the intuition of the Voronoi diagram, I'd have to like get really deep into it. This is one of the few things that I'd say, dude, just memorize it. See? So you get the gradient, then you do the negative reciprocal, which is that. Cierto? You flip it, you multiply it by a negative, and you move on with life. Number six, Ariane. Ariane has geese on her farm. She claims the mean weight of x from her black keys is less than the mean weight of x from her white keys. She records the weights of geese and grams from a random selection of geese, the data shown in the table below. Now, in order to test her claim, right, she performs a t-test at a 10% level of significance, and it is assumed that the weights of the eggs are normally distributed and the samples have equal variances. See? So now we need to state in words the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis, um, there's a couple ways to approach this. My general like hint is to always use the not, cierto? So the not whatever they tell you. In this case, they tell us. She claims the mean weight of her x from her black keys is less than the mean weight of x from her white keys. So with the idea of not, we're gonna say weight of x weight of x black keys is not Notice that here it's, it's, it's less than. I'm here putting is not less than the mean weight, probably. Yep, weight of x from whatever, the white keys. Here, Tom. All right, that is a lot of blah, blah. The biggest intuition I can give you is that, again, for null hypothesis, Think of the word not. In this case, we put not before whatever the problem gives us, and the problem gives us is less than. Cierto? So yes, we did take this whole thing, and all we did was add the word not. For real, that is that is part A, okay? Cool. Part B, calculate the p-value for this test. Now, here people get a little bit confused and freaked out because p-value sounds kind of weird. Cierto? The first couple of things you have to identify is what tests are we doing, what's the level of significance, and all that fancy stuff. 
So sh Ariane is doing a t test, ¿cierto? Now, this is a t test for weights of x from black keys and weights of x from white keys, ¿cierto? And so you have to ask yourself, how many sample sizes do I have? I have two, right? I have the ones from black and the ones from white. So when you pull up your calculator and you go to stat test, t test, a lot of people click t test right away. But careful, man. This is a two sample t test. See, so take a moment, think about it, and really approach this slowly, ¿cierto? I can plug in my data. I can either plug in using data or using stats, ¿cierto? You're almost never going to use stats, so don't worry about it. You're almost always going to use data. So for data, it asks for the lists, frequency lists, if, the, if there's any, and this guy here, ¿cierto? Okay, so let's go to data, calc, I mean, sorry, data edit, and put it to lists. So the first list is going to be the white, sorry, it's going to be the black keys. So it's 136, 134, the one on top, of course, 142, 141, 128. 126 for the next one we got 135 you know what's going on at this point see i hope you're all having a wonderful day all right stat tests two sample t test and here we are ¿cierto? so for this u symbol ¿cierto? we're gonna put the one in the middle why are we putting the one in the middle because there are no hypotheses is that um mean weight of from the white keys is not greater than the one from the black keys, ¿cierto? And white keys was my second list, ¿cierto? And so, since it's not, ¿cierto? We're going to test it like that, ¿sí? Is it pooled? We're going to put yes. Calculate. So, that is my p-value, ¿sí? So, for part b, my p-value is... Da, 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 0 0.17695. Five, three, if I recall, two, 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 yes. Okay, so that is for part B. That is my p value. For part C, we need to stay whether the result of the test supports Ariana's claim, justify your reasoning. So the, the way you kind of like conclude this stuff is that you say p value greater than level of significance implies, ¿cierto? implies that we reject HO, which is another way to say not supported by evidence. By evidence. Cool. So if that's the case, we reject the HO. If not, we accept the HO and do support the evidence. ¿cierto? So this is one of the few things you kind of have to memorize. Memorize it like that. See? And so let's see if it's true. My p-value was 0 0.176953. See? Now, is this greater than or less than what we're about to see? The level of significance. Level of significance, they said, is 10% level of significance. How do I turn 10% into a decibel? I pretty much divide it by 100. ¿cierto? So 10% is the same as 0 0.1. See? Another way you can look at it is at 100%. Is the same as 1 and 50% is the same as 0.50 so if you remember some of these couple key values ¿cierto? you can figure out any percent as a decimal see 10% has to be 0 0.10 cool so is this true the answer is yes it's true so if yes it's true we reject HO Ariane's claim is not supported by the evidence that is parts a B and C all right, for number seven, we have Professor Wei observed that students have difficulty remembering the information presented in his lectures. He modeled the percentage of information retained R by the function blah, ¿cierto? where T is the number of days after the lecture. T is, has to be greater than or equal to zero because there have to be days passed after the lecture. It wouldn't make sense to have negative days here. See? All right, so he found that one day after a lecture, students have forgotten 50% of the information presented. I think that's been pretty optimal. But, anyways, find the value of p, ¿cierto? So right now, the value of p, it will, if we look at the equation in its raw form, we have one thing we don't know, two things we don't know, three things we don't know, ¿cierto? And so if you have one equation and three things you don't know, bro, it's not good enough, ¿cierto? But 
If I plug in this and this, ¿cierto? I will know this and I will know that. So now I would have one thing I don't know and one equation and that is something I can solve. So this is our game plan and let's see what happens. See? So for part A, I'm going to plug in the information. Um, RT, ¿cierto? Is already in percent, ¿cierto? Because he modeled it as a percentage of information retained. It's already in percent. So that actually allows me to plug in 50 like this. See? Careful with that. It's an important detail. 50 equals 100 times E. E is just like a value. It's a, similar to pi. It's in my calculator. It exists. If you want to look at it, it's actually over here. It is that. The E is 2.71. ¿Vale? So yeah, E is something that we know to the power of negative P times T, which we said was 1. ¿Cierto? Just going to write it again real quick. This is 100 e to the power of negative p. See? All right. So now we need to get p alone. Now, p is on an exponent, which is really hard to deal with. ¿cierto? And so when it's on an exponent, one of the very few tools that we have in this course is this thing called calc intersect. ¿cierto? So we're going to graph this as a line in y1, graph this as a line in y2, do calc intersect, and see what happens, ¿cierto? So just to leave very clear, this is y2, this first one is y1, ¿vale? What the hell do I mean by y1, y2? Why are we intersecting? I'll explain in a second. Uh, y1 is going to be 50, as we said earlier, y2 I already have here, ¿cierto? Do power of neg negative x. Um, and now we're going to calc intersect, ¿cierto? Now, when we do calc intersect, we're going to get the value of what we're missing, ¿cierto? Because whatever makes this true, whatever equals it, whatever equals two lines is going to be its intersect, ¿cierto? That's also why we do calc intersect. And whatever makes this intersect, whatever makes this true, is whatever value of p works, or so to say. See? That is intuition. So... We go over here. We're going to change our window a little bit because we want to make sure that the answer shows up. Because one of my lines is at 50, I should at least put a y max of 50. And just so that it looks nice, I'll put 60. See? And my x value is probably going to be pretty low because we're talking about weeks. Just to make sure that I can see the graph, I'll put uh, two weeks. You know, you never know. So we graph. We get something that looks like this, and that intersect up top is the value of p that works. So I'm going to do calc intersect, select the first curve, select the second curve. We make sure it's on the second curve. Yes, it is. And now we have guess. See? The guess thing is really when you have two intersects. So for now, it doesn't really matter. But I just guess near the intersect. So you don't worry about having it like super close. Guess near the intersect. And we have that. ¿cierto? So our p value is going to be... 0 0.693147 see that is for part a so um now we need to use this bottle right to find the percentage of information retained by his professor a lot retained by his students sorry 36 hours after professor Wace's lecture see and so what a lot of people do here for part b is the following mistake think about why it's a mistake they say okay so r36 equals 100 e times negative p, which we said was negative 0.693147. And now we plug in t, which is 36. Why is this a mistake? It is a mistake because t is in number of days. We got this in hours. So 36 hours is how many days? Well, there's third, there's uh, 24 hours in one day, and this is 1.5. So 36 hours is the same as 1.5 days. See? 36 hours is the same as 1.5 days. Since this equation or function or whatever is in days, I cannot plug in hours. I need to plug in the days. See? So this is what we're dealing with. And how much is that? Let's go to our calculator. 35.35. See? So for part B, we get a value of, or for R1.5, better said, we get, 35.3553, which is the same as 35.4%. See? Given the context of the problem, that's what we're talking about. This is for part B. 
Now they tell us that based on his model, Professor Wade believes that his students will always retain some information from his lecture. We need to state a mathematical reason why Professor Wade might believe this. There's a couple of reasons to approach this, ¿cierto? The visual aspect, if we look at our graph once again, is that you can see that at the bottom, there's like something that it never quite touches, ¿cierto? Um, it doesn't go into the negative values, ¿sí? And so you can say a uh, horizontal asymptote, ¿sí? Horizontal asymptote. An asymptote is something that the graph like never touches, ¿sí? So if I have a y and an x here, and I have something that goes like that, ¿cierto? My horizontal asymptote would be here, ¿sí? My function never touches the line. It comes incredibly close, but it never, ever touches. See, so this would be a horizontal asymptote. A vertical one would be something like that. ¿cierto? Okay, so you can say there's a horizontal asymptote looking at the graph. You can also say um, these guys will always retain something because looking at my equation here, ¿cierto? there is no negative value. See? If we look here, for example, there is no negative value. Yes, there might be a negative exponent, but the the whole thing on the right side will always, always be positive. So that is another way you can answer. You can say that RT will always, always be positive. Both of these ways are valid ways of approaching. That is part C. Part D, we've got that. We need to write down one possible limitation of the domain of the model. See, Here there are like so many different things you can say. I think the most intuitive one is that, hey, not everyone, unfortunately, will remember Professor Wei on their deathbed, ¿cierto? In many, many years from now. And so one possible limitation from the domain is that uh, people don't live forever, ¿cierto? Some people die at some point. I mean, knock on wood, but maybe someone has like a car accident or something. And after three days, they'd forget because they're not around anymore, ¿cierto? So people don't live forever. That is one approach. There's a lot of different answers you can do here. I'd rather just have you think and just show you really the uh, the answer key. But also like large values of t's are not forever are not possible anyway because people don't live forever. Someone may might die halfway. Um, the answer key has it like this. See, it has all of this here. You can pause, take a moment. There's so many different approaches. I think you guys can figure it out. Uh, but yeah, that is about it. So, da, 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 let's move on. Number eight, Charlie and Daniela each began a fitness program. On day one, they both ran 500 meters. On each subsequent day, Charlie ran 100 meters more than the previous day, whereas Daniela increased her distance by 2% of the distance ran on the previous day. So we need to calculate how far Charlie ran on the day 20 of his fitness programming, and Daniela ran on the day 20 of her fitness programming. So the tough part here is understanding like how... Charlie increases his meters ran and how Daniela increases her meters ran. ¿cierto? So for the case of Charlie, see, on day one, right, uh, he was at 500. See? On day two, right, he ran 100 more than last time, so it's 500 plus 600. ¿cierto? Sorry, 500 plus 100, I said the answer aloud, 600. See, for U3, it's uh, 600 plus 100, 700, see? Well, you get you get what's going on by now. U4 is going to be 800, etc. So this is the nature of how Charlie's is increases, see? Now let's look at Daniela, see? Daniela, U1 is also 500, so that is something in common. U2, it increases by 2%. So it's 500 times 1.02 see and that gives me ba, 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 500 times 1.02 that 510 u3 it increases by two percent so it's 510 times 1.02 gives me ba, ba, ba. let's see what is going on over here 520.2 that it so yeah, we can keep going here, and we can get to U20 and take a really long time. But there's obviously quicker ways, see? 
Now, why is it important to do this? Just the first couple of terms to understand the nature of Charlie's running and the nature of Daniel's, Daniel's is running. The nature of Charlie's is running is this thing called arithmetic. Arithmetic what? Arithmetic sequences. See? It always increases by plus 100, no matter what. See? So this is actually D equals 100 in our formula booklet. For Daniela, it increases in a different matter, right? It's a, like a little bit more exponential. This is what we call a geometric sequence. See? Again, I'm pulling out fancy math words, but you need to understand this intu the intuition of like how each of them increase. So the one on the top is plus 100 each time. The one on the bottom is doesn't increase by a flat number. So here was plus 10. Here was plus 10.2. Later on, it's going to be like, dude, I don't know, uh, 10.8 maybe. Like, who knows? It doesn't increase at the same rate each time. I mean, sorry, the number that affects it isn't the same one each time because there's a certain rate to it, right? A 2% applied to it each time. And so that is just useful to identify the geometric sequences and know how to approach this. So the one on top has D equals 100. The one on the bottom, the 102, the 2% is going to be R equals 1.02, see? And so now that we have this information here and both U1s, which is way more useful than what we think. Whoops, let me try that again. Both U1s. Um, we can go to a formula booklet. Since we're talking about sequences, we're going to go here. And bada bim bada boom, cierto? So the nth term of an arithmetic sequence is the one on top. This guy here, cierto? And for the nth term of geometric, it's this guy there. Vale? So those are the equations I will be applying now. It'll look something like this. So again, for Charlie, we're going to go with Charlie first. Charlie, we have U20 equals u1, which is 500, plus n, which in this case is 20, so 20 minus 1, times 100, see? So if we go ahead and solve that, we're going to end up with u20 being equal to 2,400, see? Trust me, you can use your calculator. For Daniela, we have a similar approach, just that we use the other formula. So un, u20, will equal u1, which is 500, times r, we said was 1.02, to the power of n minus 1, n is 20. We have the minus 1 here. So u20 equals 500 times 1.02 times 19, to the power of 19, sorry. And this gives us da, 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 u20 equals, in this case, 728.405. Cool. So that is um, for part ai, cierto? and for part a double i. It's down there. See? Then they tell us, on day end of the fitness programs, Daniela runs more than Charlie for the first time. Right? Why does this happen? Because Daniela increases exponentially. So if it's a geometric sequence. She's going to catch up to Charlie eventually. Charlie might get a massive head start, but it won't be forever. Daniela will beat him eventually, no matter what. So, what we have to do here, cierto? is take our formulas for nth term and have Daniela's be bigger than Charlie's because that is what it's telling us here. Daniela at some point runs more than Charlie for the first time. So I'll actually do it up here. Maybe it'll make more sense. So for Daniela running, ¿cierto? it is um, 500 times 1.02, some n minus 1, ¿cierto? And this has to be more than, because it's what they gave us here, ¿cierto? runs more than Charlie. ¿cierto? And what was Charlie? Charlie was 500 plus n minus 1 times 100. See? And so now I actually just need to figure out n, and I'm good to go. See? All right, so now we will be taking this guy into y1. So it's going to be one equation. This guy into y2. It will be my other equation. We do calc intersect, and that will give us like the key point of n that will help us like um, interpret what value of n we need to find. ¿cierto? So wherever Daniela runs more than Charlie for the first time, remember that Dan Daniela is the geometric one. So it's going to be the curve that looks a little curvy, and the other curve is really just going to be a line. Charlie is going to be a line. Daniela is going to be curvy. See? Okay. Anyways. Um. Ba -ba -ba.
So we take our equation here, we make sure we plug in everything, ¿cierto? and we play around with our window until we get the value that is needed. So y is probably going to be pretty big. So I'm actually going to put like 5,000 and see what happens. Um, x is days, so I expect it to be much less. Let's put 50. See what happens. All right, so now we can see that I'm. This window is not great, but it's important to see why. ¿cierto? So the way that I have it drawn, right? Is something like this. ¿cierto? So that is where my window is showing. What I want to reach ¿cierto? is a point where, okay, this guy keeps growing. And this guy intersects and becomes bigger ¿cierto? and wherever it becomes bigger that is the value of n i will be trying to find see and so i'm not quite there yet and i need to keep playing around with my window and see what happens ¿cierto? so it seems like my x has to be a whole lot bigger than what i expected and i'm not sure about my y max so let's take a moment and see what happens All right, again, I need to be able to see it. I know this is a little bit tedious, but I'd rather have you guys see the process behind it. No one nails their window right away. And, you know, it's part of it. All right. I think third time's a charm if I'm not mistaken. But let's see. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Woo! All right, finally. So that is where they intersect, ¿cierto? So second, calc, intersect. First curve, second curve. Now we have guess. For guess, just put it near where they intersect. This is because some lines have more than one intersect, and you need to, like, show which value you want, ¿cierto? So, okay, that value there, that n, is just about uh, 184.215, ¿sí? So, any num this is where it intersects, right? So, right at this moment here, on the 184.215, these equations are, are the same. That means that Daniel and Charlie are running the same amount of meters right at this day. See? Now, anywhere beyond that day, we're talking about this here, which is Daniel being running more. See? And so, because it's in days, ¿cierto? Um... And the context of the problem, well, what's the next day after, like, day 184.215? Well, it has to be day 185, see? So you can put it like that for part D, or you can say um, N being greater than this value, see? Because N being greater than this value, we're talking about these values there, which are all greater than what Charlie would have run. So that is for part B. I think I said D earlier, sorry about that, part B. See, that is how you do part B. Awesome, awesome. Number nine, a triangle field ABC is such that AB is 56, BC is 82, and each measured correct to the nearest meter, and the angle at B is equal to 105. Measured correct to the nearest five angles. Five degrees, sorry. We need to calculate the maximum possible area of the field. All right, for number nine, we have a triangular field ABC is such that AB is 56. They put it there. BC is 82. They put it there. Each measured correct to the nearest meter. Important information, actually. Each measured correct to the nearest meter. And the angle B at, and the angle at B is equal to 105. They put it there. Measure correct to the nearest five degrees. All this information is super important. We will see why in a second. So they ask us, they ask us to calculate the maximum possible area of the field. So, since we're talking about area, um, if, this er if this triangle was a little bit bigger, for example, like in that way or that way, then that means that I'd have a new line over there. 
on all of this in gray, see, is area that I'd be like adding onto my triangle. See what it's called? If this was any bigger. So, can I make my sides any bigger with what they told me? Well, they told me that each of these was measured correct to the nearest meter. So, what is the nearest meter to 56 that is a little bit larger? 56.5. I cannot go beyond 0.5 because if I go to 56.6, for example, measure to correct to the nearest meter would be 57. See? So I need to leave it at 56.5. Right? Um, the 82, same idea, literally, 82.5. See? So if it's measured correct to the nearest 5 degrees, that means that this 105, ¿cierto? Can oscillate between 110 and... um. 100, ¿cierto? And so, since since that is where it can oscillate, if I have a value of, let's say, 1, sorry, uh, if my angle were, let's say, the real angle, ¿cierto? If my real angle was 102, I'd be forced to jump to the 100, ¿cierto? If my real angle was, uh, let's say, 107, let's say, I'd be forced to jump to the 105. See, that is what they mean by correct to the nearest 5 degrees. And so the, the lower limit that I can approach, and in order for me to keep hitting that 105, because we need to keep it at 105 here, ¿cierto? Is going to be 102.5. See? On this other end, it's going to be, you guessed it, 107.5. See? So those are the values I can take in order to keep uh, meshing correctly to the nearest 5 degrees. To reach 105 see so th these are like the two extremes i can use ¿vale? that's like the idea and so which of these extremes give me a bigger area let's find out now how the hell do you get the area of a triangle like this most of you are probably thinking of area being base times height divided by two and you might be thinking this okay this could be the base but this being the height nah bro it's slanted man it's slanted it's not the height you actually can't get the height here. So what the hell do you do? Well, when in doubt, check out the formula booklet. So, formula booklet. Let's put area of triangle. Nothing shows up. I probably have to write it differently. Here we have area of triangle. We have two equations, ¿cierto? We have the one with base times height. We already saw it doesn't work. Let's move on to the next one. Area of triangle looking like this. See? How the hell does that work? I'll talk about it in a second. So we have uh, one half times little a times little b times sine c. Why do I say small, little, big, etc.? Because in trigonometry, ¿cierto? I have a couple examples of this in some of my other videos. But um, the small letters, ¿cierto? Are going to be sides. So if here I have side a, for example, that means I have big angle paired to it. If here I have little b, I have big angle paired to it, ¿cierto? Inversely, if I have big angle C, I have a little C side paired to it. See, So that is like how the little and big letters work in the world of trigonometry. When I use this equation here for the formula of, uh, the, 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 of area of a triangle, see, notice that these pairs, ¿cierto? the A and the B have nothing to do with the C. ¿cierto? They, are, they, are, they are not like, a, they don't have pairs in common. They are all like it's an individual sort of pair. What I mean is that this 56 goes with that angle. This 82 goes with that angle. And so I can use this, this equation because none of them go to the angle that is in question or that I was used. ¿cierto? That is why it's legal. Okay. So. All right. So now that that got explained, let's remember that we're using these big and small values. ¿cierto? So we're going to have two scenarios. We're going to have a scenario where we plug in. Um, well, of course, the biggest sides always, ¿cierto? So we're going to have A equals 1 half times A, ¿cierto? Times B times sine C, ¿cierto? Now, this sine C, we said there's two options. We got this guy and this guy, ¿cierto? So we actually have to compare and see which one is bigger, ¿sí? So, and whichever one is bigger is the maximum possible area of the field, ¿sí? So this is my first case and my second case, ¿sí? It's going to be down here. sine 107.5 see so those are the biggest and smallest values 
of my angle. Let's see which one gives me the bigger value, ¿cierto? So we take this guy here, uh, 102.5 gives me that. 102, sorry, 107.5 gives me that. Which one is bigger? The one on top, which is the 102 one. So this one is bigger, see? It gives me 227.5.37, see? Because it's area, we put meters squared. So the maximum possible area of the field is that right there, see? Awesome, awesome. That is how you solve number nine. Number 10. Number 10, a game is played where two unbiased dice are rolled and the score in the game is the greater of the two numbers shown. Ojo, the score in the game is the greater of the two numbers shown. If the two dice are the same, then the score in the game is the number shown on one of the dice. A, di a diagram showing the possible outcomes is given below. So let's understand like how the game works in the first place. See, So if my first die is 1 and my second one is also 1, well, what is my biggest value? It's 1. If my first die is 2 and my second die is 1, what is my biggest value? It's 2. Biggest value here is 3, 4, 5, 6. See? So those are pretty easy. ¿cierto? I can do the same on the other end. And now I keep filling in. ¿cierto? Here, it's going to be 2 as well. ¿vale? Ba, 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 2. Here, it's going to be 3. Here, it's going to be 4, 5, 6. See? Down at the bottom, we have 3, 3, 4, 5, 6. I know it's a little bit tedious, but... Eventually, you're going to notice a pattern that's going to be really easy to, like, follow or whatever. See? First thing, here it's increasing 1, 2, 3. ¿cierto? That means I can put 4, 5, 6. Here, there's a bunch of 5s. ¿cierto? So I can put 5. Here I can put 6, 6. Here I can put 4, 4. Here I can put 5, 5, 5. Here I can put 6, 6, 6. All right. That was just a patterns thing. If you have trouble noticing them, Dude, don't worry. Just take your moment. Fill in the diagram. The patterns thing was just to make it quick. But you do have to fill it in because it's going to make it a lot easier for parts A, B, and C. So, let T be the random variable, the score in the game. Complete the table to show the probability distribution of T. So, if the score in the game is 1, we have to find the probability that this is, you know, a thing. ¿cierto? So, where are my 1s? Here's my 1. Is there any other 1? No, there's not, because I filled in my table, and it's much easier to see now. So this is going to be probability of 1. Out of how much? Out of my total. What is my total? All of the black dots. You can count them one by one, or you can do 6 times 6, because here there is 6, and there there is 6. 6 times 6 is going to be 36. 1 over 36, probability of getting a 1. What about a 2? The 2s are there. That is how many? 3. My total is unchanged, 3 out of 36. My threes are there. One, two, three, four, five. Five over 36. My fours. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven, 36. Fives. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. God damn. Nine over 36. Another pattern. I'm adding by two each time. Look at that. 11 out of 36. See? If you want to double check, you can also count. That's what I'm doing now. 10, 11. All right, cool beans. See? Yep. So that is part A. Part B, find the probability that a player scores at least three in a game. So at least, ¿cierto? That means it can score three, four, five, or six, but it's at least three. So three, four, five, six is going to be, let me do it in red, ¿cierto? At least three, any one of these boys, ¿cierto? So what's the probability of rolling? Or getting 3, 4, 5, or 6, we would have 5 over 36 plus 7 over 36 plus 9 over, that is a 9 by the way, sorry, 9 over 36 plus 11 over 36. See? Why am I adding here? Because you add when you talk with or in probabilities. ¿cierto? So this guy scores either 3 or 4 or 5 or 6, 3 or 4 or 5, or 6. See? That is why we are adding. If I say and, when calculating probabilities, 
we would be multiplying, okay? Just a general rule of thumb. Might as well put it down here, multiply, if you find yourself saying and, see? Cool, so that is P, B part I. Um, let's of course find out how much that is. That is 32, 32 over 36, see? So that is part B, part A. Part B, part double I, we have a player score six, given that they scored at least three. This one is a little bit tougher, but, 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 but. The word given, you should immediately think conditional. This is one of the few things you kind of have to memorize. Anytime it says given, it's a condition, ¿cierto? So we're talking about conditional probability. What the hell is conditional probability? Check your formula booklet. We have this here, ¿cierto? It looks a little nasty, but hey, let's work around it, ¿sí? So, this is how you, like, approach it, ¿vale? Um, what this is telling you here is that the probability that you get A given B, ¿sí? Equals ba, 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 probability of A and B divided by, I think it was PB, ¿cierto? Divided by PB, ¿sí? So writing it out, I have probability of A given B equals probability of A and B divided by probability of just B, ¿sí? So I just turned these symbols into words and it's going to be easier to understand what I'm plugging in, ¿cierto? So if here it says a player scores six, given that they scored at least three, this is my given, ¿cierto? All right. So probability that they scored six, given that they scored at least three. So what the conditional probability does is that it sort of like makes smaller your sample, ¿cierto? Like where you're pooling from. And so all of the ones that scored at least three are all of the guys over here, ¿cierto? So you're kind of like forgetting about the one and two for now, ¿sí? Now let's just have faith in the formula and follow it, ¿sí? So, so P of A given B, ¿cierto? We're tr still trying to figure it out. A and B, ¿cierto? So it's anyone that scored at least three and scored six is going to be orange and this, ¿cierto? So what is the probability that I roll an orange? Well, we got it here, 32 over 36. Probability that I roll a six, we put it in yellow, ¿cierto? So and B. I said that we multiply, we say and. So I will be multiplying over here. Um, 32 over 36 times da, 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 11 over 36. ¿sí? Probability of just B, ¿cierto? Given that they scored at least 3 is this guy here, 32 over 36. And so here it looks nasty. You can put it in your calculator. It's going to work. But you can actually get rid of this guy with this guy because it's numerator and denominator. It's multiplying and end up with just 11 over 36. That is PAB. That is part B double I. See? Awesome. Finally, part C. Find the expected score of the game. So the expected score is a little bit more weird. See? And it kind of has to do with like um, how many ones you have, how many twos you have, how many threes you have, how many fours, fives, and six, and the probability of each of these in a way, ¿cierto? So I know it, it sounds kind of weird, it's hard to explain, but let's follow the formula and, you know, it'll, it'll make more sense, ¿sí? So for the expected value, ¿vale? We need to ask ourselves, how many ones do we have, ¿cierto? I'll actually do it up here because there's way more space. So how many ones do we have? Well, we have one one. So one times one. See? How many twos do we have? We have three twos. How many threes do we have? We have da, 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 one, two, three, four, five. Five threes. ¿cierto? How many fours? Seven threes. Sorry, how many fours? Seven fours. How many fives? Nine fives. How many sixes? Nine sixes. See? So that is how you set it up. Now, my expected value here is not quite done yet. ¿cierto? It's not quite done because I need to look at my scenarios. ¿cierto? And there are 36 scenarios here. So I divide by 36. 
the most important step is understanding like okay there's one one so i do one times one how many twos there's three twos so i do three times two and i add in between them because it is an expected value divide by 36 because there's 36 of these bad boys right here 36 cases i have to do i have to do it like this see so i put this into my calculator see what i get you're going to end up with 161 over 36 see which is the same as uh, 4.4722. Okay? And so what this is telling me is that each, each time that you play this game, your expected amount of like score you're going to get is this here. Is a little bit more than 4. See? All right? That is number 10. See? Awesome. Now, just a couple more left. Oh. I skipped one by accident. Number 11. If a shark is spotted near to Brighton Beach, a lifeguard will activate a siren to warn swimmer swimmers. So we've got the sound intensity I of the siren varies inversely with the square of the distance D from the siren where D is greater than zero. So inversely, I know that inversely can be very weird. What this is telling me is that the farther away you are in distance, the less sound you will hear because it is inversely related. See, that is the intuition of the word inversely in this problem. They also tell us that it is known that at a distance of 1.5 meters from the siren, the sound intensity is 4 watts per second, see, per square meter, sorry. So we need to show that I equals 9 divided by D squared. Now it's just, it's, it tell, since it is telling you show, you kind of have to like start from zero. See, you cannot work backwards here, plug in 1.5, plug in 4, and show it that way. You have to start from zero. And so the way that you start from zero here is that, hey, you kind of like forget about the nine for a second and you go, okay, um, so how can you get this nine? How can you prove that this is nine? Well, I equals K, because we still haven't figured out nine yet since we are showing, see, divided by D squared, see? And now I can plug in 1.5 and 4. So if I plug in 1.5, it is meters. That's going to be the one on the bottom. So I'm going to have K divided by 1.5 squared. Uh, 4 watts is going to be I, so I'm going to leave that there. See? I need to get K alone. So I multiply by 1.5 squared to both sides in order to get it rid from the, uh, you know, from the denominator equals K. K now will give me 9. See? And now that we know that K is 9, we plug it in over here, and that is how we show that... Um, I equals 9 divided by D squared, ¿cierto? It's with these steps shown below, see? You cannot plug in, I insist, you cannot plug in 1.5 and 4 watts immediately. You have to do the K thing, see? You have to show how you figured out that this 9 is 9. For part B, when you sketch the curve of I on the axis below, showing clearly the point 1.5 comma 4. So, there's a couple of ways to approach this. I think the best one is making life easy on yourself and just graphing this on your calculator and literally copying the graph. See? Copy the graph and put the important points. So, we go to y equals. We erase this bad boy. We put this guy up here, which we said was 9. Oops, let me erase everything, sorry. We take this 9, we divide it by x squared. We go to window, we copy the window that they give us, which is a y of 20, ¿cierto? a y minimum of negative 5, oop, nailed it, an x of 6, oh, an x minimum 0, see? So let's graph this. It looks like that. Copy the graph, see? Make sure there's a little bit of a gap here, ¿cierto? From here to here, there's a little bit of a gap. And it should be very close to 6, see? All right, very close to 6, but doesn't touch. Is that it? Am I done yet? No. I still need to show the point 1.5 comma 4, see? So 1.5 comma 4. This one, you can eyeball it a little bit. Of course, make sure that it makes sense. If this is around 10, then 4 would be whatever, like here, ¿cierto? 1.5 comma 4. See? So here you get the two points by one labeling it, the point, and two making the graph like make sense. 
And one of the biggest ways you can do that is making sure that you never touch six. So it should look something like that. Oh, and make it end just at six, cierto? Don't go, don't go like that. See, leave it at six and you'll get full, full credit. And this little gap here will also give you, or make sure that you get full credit. See? Yeah, well, so that's part A, that's part B. Part C. Whilst swimming, Scarlet can hear the siren only if the sound intensity of her location is greater than that. See? So, only if the sound intensity, which you said was I, is greater than, so this has to be greater than, 1.5 times 10 to the power of negative 6. See, th th that is like words into math, ¿cierto? Sound intensity greater than whatever number they gave us, see? And so this is where she can hear, where she can hear. So if we need to find the values of D where Scarlet cannot hear, it would have to be the opposite, ¿cierto? So not the one on top, because the one on top is can, the one on the bottom is cannot, see? Awesome, so we're using the one on the bottom. My f equation for I, we saw earlier, of course, it's nine divided by D squared. This has to be less than 1.5 times 10 to the power of negative six. All I need to do is get D squared alone, see? So, um, let's go ahead and multiply D squared to both sides. So I end up with D is less than 1.5 times 10 to the power of negative six times D squared, cierto? Now I gotta get D squared alone, divide by both sides like this, see? This helps me get rid of that and that. So nine divided by 1.5 times 10 to the power of negative six is less than D squared. I need a, I still need to get D alone. So I'm actually gonna do square root to both sides. That is one nasty square root. Sorry, it's been a long video. Nine divided by 1.5 times 10 to the power of negative six is less than D. See, so whatever this gives me is, uh, you know, well, it's my answer, see? So, calculator. We do square roots of a fraction, nine divided by 1.5 times 10 to the power of negative six. Okay, it gives me this, see? So, 244.948. Less than D. Less than or equal to D. See? Um, why is it or equal to when I actually missed it earlier? It's because if my can is greater than, my cannot has to have the or equal to. See? Because you need to include the value that's like in between. And so the opposite would actually be this. See? I missed the or equal to. My bad, but I noticed it at the very end. I hope that you did as well at some point. That is the explanation. That is number, which one was this? Number 11. Number 12 is absolutely nasty. We have that Ellis designs a gift box. The top of the gift box is in the shape of the right angle triangle, G, I, K. A rectangular section, H, I, J, L, which is this guy here, is inscribed inside the triangle. The lengths of G, H, J, K, H, L, and A, L, J are P, Q, 8, and 6, respectively. See, this is all stuff that the diagram already has. We read it, make sure that it's there anyways, because you never know. And now we begin, see? The area of the top of the gift box is A centimeter squared. So we need to find A in terms of P and Q. So careful, for a lot of people top of the gift box, they're gonna look at the diagram and be like, ah, so it's this guy here, see, it's top of the gift box. Read carefully, bro. They tell us that the top of the gift box is in the shape of the right angle triangle GIK. So this whole guy is the top of the gift box. See, read carefully, you never know. Anyways, um, so for part A, part I, we are talking about a right angle triangle, see? And so this is a little bit hard to visualize, but as a right angle triangle, this actually looks like this. I'm gonna make it stand up straight. Um, K is going to be my height, I is going to be here, and G is going to be there. See? This is 90 degrees. Yeah, that's about it. 
Oh, well, and if I'm going to get super technical, this is H. This is J. This is L. So, and we're going to put these values here as well. J, L is 6. This guy is 8. And that is all we know. See? Oh, we also know, sorry, that this guy is P. And that J, K is Q. See? Cool. All right, so we need to find the area of this whole guy here. Now, um, there's a lot of different ways to approach this. The one that's easy, easiest for me is to notice that, A, this rectangle here, ¿cierto? is, well, I mean, the shape here <laughs> is a rectangle, the one in orange. So that means that that 6 up there means that this guy down here is a 6. And that 8 over there means that this guy over here is also an 8, ¿cierto? And so suddenly, I can now use the classic base times height divided by 2. Base times height divided by 2. So finding A in terms of P and Q, we can say base, which is 6 plus P, times height, which is Q plus 8, divided by 2. That is one way to do it. There's a, dude, there's like a million. See, but I'm going to do it like this for now. And next, we need to show that A is that. Now, what is special about this? Notice that we have 192 divided by Q plus 3q plus 48. There is no p. There is no p. So you need to find a way to say um, p equals something q, ¿cierto? And plug in q, ¿vale? So that is our current goal. We need to find ways to link both equations, ¿cierto? All right. So what are ways in which we can end up with, like, a way to relate p and q? See, that is our biggest challenge right now. We need to find a way to relate p and q. Again, there are a lot of approaches, and so this is one of those problems that you really have to stare at and like think about for a while. But just to be efficient, ¿cierto? notice that this angle here is the same as that angle there. See? Why are they the same? Because of this following property that looks like this. In parallel lines, if you have something cutting through it, this guy is the same as this guy. See? Just to help you remember, this guy is also the same as this guy. See? That is a property I'm talking about. But I'm talking about this angle there and this angle there. See? Which are the same ones that I drew in orange earlier. And so this theta and this theta are quite literally the same. So let's do a little bit of trigonometry. I'm sure you've heard of Sokatoa for sine, uh, cosine, and tangent. F um, for tangent, we have Toa, which is TOA. That means opposite over adjacent, ¿cierto? And so, let's see what happens if I do the toa of this theta, ¿cierto? So we have tan theta. Let's go with the one on top first, ¿cierto? Opposite is Q, divided by adjacent is 6. Let's do the theta of the other guy. Opposite is 8, adjacent is P. All right, so I can take these two bad boys, ¿cierto? And sort of equal them to each other. So I have Q over 6 equals 8 over P, ¿sí? Now, um, so we're doing this in order to get P equals something and get rid of all my P's, ¿sí? And turn them into Q's and end up with an A that only has Q's, ¿sí? All right, so in this stage, we cross multiply. We have 8 times 6 equals P times Q. See, 8 times 6 is 48. 48 equals P times Q. So this is one thing that can help us. We need to get uh, P equals something. ¿cierto? So P equals 48 divided by Q. So these are two things that can help us. See? All right. Awesome. 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 So we need to use this to plug in over here. ¿cierto? And to do that, we're going to end up with this guy there. I know that we're going to end up with this guy there because I'm going to have only Qs. See, that is the goal right now. End up with only Qs. So let's develop what I have written over here first. Um, I'm going to distribute over there, ¿cierto? And have 
6 times q, 6q, right? Plus 6 times 8, he said was 48. Plus p times q, pq. Plus p times 8, 8p. Okay? All of this being divided by 2. Okay? Now, just because it's easier to like sort of visualize, I'm going to draw it out to divide it by 2. It's affecting each term individually, so it actually looks like that. I think this is just much easier to grasp, certo? Okay, p divided by two. I'm not gonna plug in yet. I'm gonna do. I'm gonna let the two do what it does, certo? And now I'm gonna plug in. Okay. So we said that p was 48 divided by q, certo? All right. So now we're gonna plug in. We end up with area being equal to 3q. This remains unchanged. 24 remains remains unchanged. We said that PQ was 48, so 48 divided by 2. And we have 4 times P. We said that P was 48 divided by Q. So that's going to be a weird one. Certo? All right, A. A equals 3Q, still unchanged, plus 24, still unchanged. 48 divided by 2 is 24. And that weird one in the end is 4 times 48, which will give me 192 divided by Q. See? So A equals... 192 divided by Q plus 3Q plus 48. See, if I organize my terms a little bit, I end up with that, which is the same that what, what we're trying to show. See, now I know that this part got a little bit messy, but again, your compass never lose sight of what you're trying to get. So if these are only Qs, find a way to get P equals something. P equals something in terms of Q. So that you can plug in and end up with just Q. See? Now we need to find dA over dQ. What's that? What that is telling you is that you take the the formula with your A, certo, which is this guy here, and you do the derivative in respects to Q. Now, of course, you want to do it with whatever has only Q, certo, which is the one down here. And so um, let me use another color. dA over dQ. See? It's going to get a little bit tricky when Q is on the bottom. Cierto? And so before I do the derivative, if you have a variable on the bottom, you want to put it on top first. See, it's just going to be easier in your life. Trust me. 192 times Q to the power of negative 1 plus 3Q plus 48. So all I did here was bring the Q up top. See, Negative exponents work like that. See, So let me take a moment to explain that. 2 to the power of 2 is 4. 2 to the power of 3 is 8. 2 to the power of 4 is 16. See? So you can see that here I'm doing times 2. Cierto? Each time. If I want to go backwards, I actually divide by 2. So 16 divided by 2 gives me 8. 8 divided by 2 gives me 4. So on and so on. So if I keep going, divided by 2. 4 divided by 2 is 2. 4 divided by... Sorry, 2 divided by 2 is going to be 1. That's also why anything to the power of 0 is 1. And if I keep going, 2 to the power of negative 1 is 1 half, cierto? 2 to the power of negative 2 is uh, 1 over 4, see? And the step in between, cierto, of 2 to the power of negative 2 is that I actually do 1 over 2 to the power of 2 equals 1 over 4, see? So that is what the negative exponent does. That's all the explanation was for. Um, so I can, I can rewrite my original equation to this. Makes it much, much easier to do the derivative. So, uh, derivative of a exponent, it goes down in front, cierto? so negative 1, and you do minus 1 to the exponent. So, negative 1, minus 1, negative 2, see? For this 3q, there's a hidden 1 for the exponent, cierto? so it's going to be 3 times 1, cierto? so it's just 1 times 3, nothing really changes, times q to the power of 0, see? Now, q to the power of 0 is just 1, right? And 1 times 3 is just going to be 1. It's just, sorry, 1 times 3 is just going to be 3. So this second term actually stays like that. For the last one, we have plus 48. It's a constant, so it stays like that. See? Anyways, that is the answer for um, for part B. See? If you want to leave it, like, super fancy, it would be like this. You put one negative 192. You put the Q back on the bottom. And you do plus 3 over there. That is for part B.
Uh, moving on, we have that Ellis. Ellis wishes to find the value of Q that will minimize the area of the top of the gift box. Write down an equation Ellis could solve to find this value of Q, and hence or otherwise find this value of Q here. See? So, optimization. See? For optimization, it is a whole lot easier than what you think. See? So, for optimization, what you want to do is take your derivative, take your derivative, and equal that bad boy to zero. This will always work. See, it's just it's just how optimization works. You take the derivative, you equal to zero. Bada bim, bada boom. I have explanations on why this works in some of my other videos. The quick recap is that since we're dealing with a quadratic, cierto, which is something like this, and a derivative is your rate of change, cierto. If you have a rate of ch this rate of change here is like negative four. See, this rate rate of change over here is a uh, whatever negative three, cierto. This rate of change there at the vertex is zero, cierto? And so at zero, you will always have your vertex in a quadratic with your der derivative, see? If you were to have a maximum, this guy here would have its derivative of zero. This guy here would have a derivative of like two, see? So that's why you're equal to zero. You are always, always going to find the vertex there. And well, that's how you optimize, cierto? Min or max is always at the vertex. So. Um, take your derivative and equal to zero. So C part I, actually, the thing that asks you for the equation is going to be negative 182 divided by Q squared plus 3 equals zero. Literally, that is C part I. C part double I is, of course, solving this. See? So we're going to put uh, 182 divided by Q squared to the other side. 3 equals 192 divided by Q squared. Multiply both sides by q squared. 3q squared equals 192. Divide by 3 to both sides first. So q squared equals however much that is. Um, let's check. 192 divided by 3. 64. See? Square root of 64. How much is this? q is going to be 8. Don't forget the units. Centimeters. See? Square root of 64, you can check here, is going to be 8. Cool. Cool, 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 cool. So, big idea here. When you optimize, you equal to 0. See? That is for number 12. Number 13, last but not least, if I'm not mistaken, we have Sion hits golf balls into the air. Each time she hits a ball, she records theta, the angle at which the ball is launched into the air, and L, the horizontal distance in meters which the ball travels from the point of contact to the first time it lands. The diagram below represents this information. There it is. Siyun anal analyzes her results and concludes that. I don't know how she did that, but she a genius. See? So they're giving us the derivative see, of the angle. So let's see. Determine whether the graph of L against theta is increasing or decreasing at theta equals 50. See? Now, an important thing to understand is that when you take the derivative of something, you are now in the world of rate of change. So if your rate of change is positive, um, your derivative is positive. For example, this point here. See, If your rate of change is equal to zero, ¿cierto? you would be talking about this maximum here, this maximum here, this maximum here. That's also why you're equal to zero for maximizing. See, And so we need to take this uh, formula that they gave us, ¿cierto? and see if it's increasing or decreasing at 50. So if it's a positive value, it's increasing. If it's negative value, it's decreasing. Pretty state straightforward, see? So I'm going to take uh, dl divided by d theta equals negative 0 0.2 times 50 plus 9. So negative 2 times 50, what the hell is that? Negative 0.2 times 50, apologize. Gives me negative 9 negative 10, sorry, plus 9, negative 1, see? So negative 10 plus 9, negative 1. So this guy, this negative 1, is negative, ¿cierto? It is less than 0, which means that at A, it is decreasing. That is how you do part A, see? Then we have that C on, observes that when the angle is 40 degrees, the ball will travel horizontal distance of 205.5. Find an extraction of the function L, L theta. See? Okay, so the tough part here 
is um, understanding what the heck to do. See? And so the intuition, the best intuition I can give is that this dl over d theta actually came from this. So what you did is that you took this guy, you did the derivative and got this. The next step to have in mind is that if you take this guy and you do the integ integral, t, you end up with the original one. T. And so you need to do the integral of this guy here. Theta plus 9. T. So if you do the integral of this, you're going to end up with your original bad boy. Got it? That is the plan. T. So a couple of things. Since we're talking about the integral of an exponent, Cierto? What exponents do I have here? Well, this theta is to the power of 1, t. And so clearly, my past exponent, which had to have been 2, because in the derivative of an exponent, you do minus 1, cierto? My original must have had a 2 up there. That 2 multiplied something in front that gave me negative 0.20. So that 2 multiplied something that gave me negative 0.20. I can write it out like this, and I'll get the answer. You can also do it intuitively, but if you want to get fancy, this is how you would do it. Negative 0.2 divided by 2, negative 0.1, see? So negative 0.1 is what was originally in front of the theta. That is um, my first term, ¿cierto? Now what about the 9? The 9 is alone, there's no theta next to it. But in a derivative, if you have a constant lying around, after you do the derivative, after you do the derivative, then a variable must have been next to it, see? For example, 9 theta. Because when you do the derivative of this, ¿cierto? the theta goes away. That's pretty much it, see? And lastly, because it's an integral, you have to do plus c. You absolutely have to put plus c. Plus c is a constant. Because there could have been a secret constant here that we do not know about that disappeared with the derivative, see? So that is why we put plus c. The biggest thing is understanding like um, how to do the derivative backwards. If you understand well derivative, derivative, derivatives, just do it backwards and that's the integral. You're good to go. See? But anyways, um, we have this. ¿cierto? And now it makes sense that they give us this information here. That sine observes. That sine observes that when the angle is 40 degrees, ¿cierto? the ball will travel a horizontal distance of 205.5. That's telling you that when we plug in 205.5 for the distance, we will have a theta of 40. T. And this is actually a set of points. ¿cierto? So that set of points we're going to plug in down here. And so we're going to have that the distance, which we said it was 205.5, so 205.5 equals negative 0 0.10 theta, which we said was 40, squared plus 9 times 40 plus c. See? We're doing this to get the value of c. That it? Once we get the value of c, we're done. So let's get c alone. See? Let's let our numbers play around for a little bit. Let them dance. We have that negative 10. Sorry, the negative point 0.10 times 40 squared be negative 160. This is being this la la we add 9 times 40 which we know is 360 plus c mm -hmm. so 25.5 equals 200 plus c c has to be 5.5 cuz we do minus 200 to both sides see all right so c is 5.5 that means that my original function is negative 0.1 theta squared plus 9 theta, plus the c that I put earlier, 5.5, t. So again, we have to do this in order to get the c and fill in our function as it is, t. Cool beans. That is how we solve this last exercise over here, number 13. Ladies and gentlemen, that is this whole test. I hope it helped. If you saw this from beginning to end, like, bro, you a G? I wish you the best. I hope this helped. I am very tired after doing all of this. But hey, anything for education, right? Keep it real, homies. You got this.
Peace.